better historicize and understand um, what happened two weeks ago with the Capitol and the prehistory to that kind of mob violence that we witnessed that day. And as we thought, you know, as a group about um, the experience of the last four years and the ways in which we might have seen what happened in DC um, about to occur long before it did. I tried to think about folks I knew on campus who could help us understand through a variety of lenses how we might frame and contextualize um, not only January 6th, but um, the momentum of the last four years and indeed the last century, I would say, building us toward um, the storming of the Capitol. So I think to anyone who is familiar with a longer stretch of American or European history might not have been particularly surprised by what happened on January 6th. As a scholar who studies um, the far right and their use of media networks, um, I honestly was surprised that um, what we witnessed on the 6th was um, less violent, you know, that it wasn't as violent as I anticipated it would have been. Scholars across the country, as well as activists who've been tracking um, the building force of right wing online media groups were well aware that the planning of these types of insurrections were underway. We saw in Michigan, the Capitol storm this summer, um, there was ample evidence in online fora that this was an event that would be likely to occur. And the um, ease with which platforms enable the organizing and facilitation of events like January 6th are one of the th threads I think we can pull out as we try to understand the moment that we're in. But I also want us to, to think through a larger historical arc that could um, help to point toward um, key junctures in the past that give us insight into the present we inhabit now. And the scholars I've invited to join us today to speak about um, these issues, I think are perfectly suited to, to kind of help us in that journey of understanding. We're going to keep folks muted now. I want to give you um, just um, a little bit of guideline for the process of what we're going to do. And then um, I'll briefly, very briefly, introduce each of the speakers and turn things over to them. So, you know, we're in a, a regular um, Zoom meeting format, which is, you know, one of the reasons we have y'all muted. We've set the parameters to enter the forum based on having a USC email address. But we all know from events that have happened over the past year that um, actors in bad faith may be among us. And if something were to happen as the meeting unfolds and any um, Zoom bombing attempt occurred, we would immediately end the session. If you're registered for the event, you'd then get a backup link via email. But we want you to know that's the, the kind of protocol for how we'll move forward. Um, in terms of the flow of the next hour to 90 minutes, um, each panelist has been asked to speak for five to eight minutes um, about their area of expertise in relation to the moment that we're in. And then um, we'll have a little conversation between the panelists themselves and then open up to audience questions and hear from you as well. So in the order in which they'll present, um, first will be Professor Ariella Gross, who's the John B. and Alice R. Sharp Professor of Law and History in the law school here at USC. Her research and writing focus on race and slavery in the United States, and she um, is well positioned to help us think about how US history and histories around white supremacy um, tie into the moment we're in today. Paul Lerner is the director of the Max Cade Institute for Austrian German Swiss Studies and is a professor of history who teaches modern German and Central European history. Ellen Sider is the Nino Endowed Chair in Television Studies 
and one of my colleagues in cinema and media studies here in the School of Cinematic Arts. She writes around a wide array of topics, but I think particular to today, her understanding of media industry studies, of media policy, and of legal issues around media are very relevant to the scenario we find ourselves in. So um, I will um, first turn us over to Ariella and um, if you can't unmute yourself, Ariella, I could unmute you. There we go. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you. And thank you, Tara, for including me in this uh, really important conversation. And it's great to be here with um, my colleagues uh, to talk about this. Um, this semester, I'm teaching constitutional law for the first time, actually, the 14th Amendment. And of course, the 14th Amendment is one of the Reconstruction Amendments, uh, part of what Eric Foners called the second founding, the transformation of the Constitution after the Civil War. Um, these are the amendments that ended slavery, that created national birthright citizenship, that transformed the relationship of the federal government to the states, of states to individual citizens. Um, and they provided the basis for kind of basic civil rights for freed black people, including the right to vote and equal protection of the laws. Reconstruction was really a remarkable political moment when people who had just a few years earlier been legally held as property were elected to public office, became delegates to state constitutional conventions, and exercised significant political power across the U.S. South. In fact, the, um, to some extent, the greatest level of Black political participation until now. <laughs> um, there were two Black politicians elected to the U.S. Senate during Reconstruction, Hiram Revels and Blanche Bruce, both of Mississippi. There wouldn't be another Black senator until a hundred years later, and not from the South until Tim Scott of South Carolina was appointed to his seat in 2013. And in that case, Scott represented a very different Republican Party um, from the one uh, from the Republicans of Reconstruction. Um, since the mid 20th century, as you know, it's been the Democratic Party that that's the political party championing civil rights. So what we're seeing today, the election of the first black Democratic Party senator from the South, Ralph Warnock, black organizers and voters shifting the balance of power in Georgia and in the Electoral College to win the presidency um, for the Democratic Party echoes the rise of black Republican power in uh, the South during the first Reconstruction. And it's something that um, we haven't seen to some extent, to that extent since the first Reconstruction. But the other echoes we're seeing today are more sinister. And that's the white supremacist backlash to black political power that arose during Reconstruction, gained steam in the late 19th and early 20th centuries during the era of Jim Crow, some historians refer to as the mater of U.S. history, kind of the low point in our history of white supremacy. Um, I want to suggest that we're looking for antecedents of the assault on the Capitol by a right-wing mob seeking to overturn the results of an election. We can look no further than two events from our own history, the Colfax Massacre and the Wilmington Massacre. So just, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to tell you about those two events. Maybe maybe you already know about them, but, um, but many surprising number of, of Americans don't. Um, the Colfax, I'm going to see if I can actually, I just have a couple of images. I'm going to see if I can share um, my screen with you. Um, here we go. How's that? Um, of course, I lost you, but I'm hoping that you all <laughs> can see this. Um, uh, yes. yes, thank you. <laughs> OK, 
because I lost my um, my little Brady Bunch pictures. Um, the Colfax massacre is a little better known only because it led to a major Supreme Court case narrowing the interpretation of the Reconstruction Amendments. Um, on April 13, 1873, in the wake of a contested election, the 1872 election in Louisiana, both at the gubernatorial level and for local offices, a group of Republicans, mostly black, and militia, also mostly black, gathered at the Grant Parish Courthouse in Colfax to defend the newly elected Republican officials. And a group of white Democrats armed with rifles and a cannon, um, which is pictured here, um, stormed the courthouse, killed as many as 150 mostly black defenders. Um, most are shot at point blank range after having surrendered or been captured. Three whites died. The number of black victims is hard to know because so many bodies were thrown into the river. Um, the historical marker that uh, is there to, death, to this day says 150. Now this historical marker, um, which is still there in 2021, represents typical Southern memory of massacres like this. This, it says, this event marked the end of carpetbag misrule in the South. Um, and unfortunately, that is um, very much the way that, um, that most uh, uh, Southern, sorry, hang on, um, the way that, that uh, the South has remembered events like this um, to a great extent. Now, after um, this event, there actually was a federal prosecution of the wrongdoers. The U.S. attorney indicted 93 aggressors, but because of lack of funds, only nine were prosecuted. Six went to trial. Three were convicted by black, most majority black juries. Federal pro um, prosecution and conviction um, was based on the Enforcement Acts of 1870 and 1871, um, and they were, and that was then appealed to the Supreme Court, and the court ruled in an infamous case uh, called U.S. versus Cruikshank that the Fourteenth Amendment couldn't. Um, Congress didn't have the, the right to enforce the 14th Amendment in a case like this because it involved only private individuals and not um, state actors. Um, and it also said that what had happened to the, these people was not a badge of servitude and therefore it couldn't, uh, the 13th Amendment couldn't extend to it. Um, so that meant that the federal government could no longer use the Enforcement Acts um, to, uh, uh, to prosecute paramilitary groups like uh, the Klan and the White League and voter suppression, which was happening across the South. Um, the Wilmington Massacre of 1898 was, if anything, more eerily similar to what happened at the Capitol on January 6th. Um, in 1898, nine white supremacists conspired to overthrow a biracial Republican government in Wilmington, North Carolina. They drafted this white declaration of independence, which called for removal of elected officials and the disfranchisement of black voters. And it argued that the Constitution of the United States contemplated government to be carried on by an enlightened people, not an ignorant population. Um, uh, so this group met at the armory, marched to the office of the black-owned newspaper, burned it to the ground, and by the end of the massacre, almost 300 people were dead. The majority black city was in ruins. And not only did they claim that they had rescued white people from Negro rule, um, but that story that what was referred to as the Wilmington race riot was an event to be proud of. They had rescued the city from um, black misrule, remained part of North Carolina memory until extremely recently. However, um, just in November of 2019, a new a uh, marker was put on, on in that spot um, that recognizes and refers to 
the uh, incident as the Wilmington coup. And historians today now recognize that this was the, until January 6th, this was the only coup d'etat in uh, U.S. history. Um, and uh, uh, now, unfortunately, we can add um, another to that list. Um, so I'm going to stop and uh, pass it on. Thank you, Ariella. Um, next up, we have um, Professor Lerner. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really delighted to be here um, among my colleagues and other members of the community. Um, my, my contribution today results from several sources and several intertwined questions and concerns that have risen to the fore really beginning in 2015 um, when Trump first announced his candidacy for the presidency and then reaching a more of a crescendo um, through the election of 2016, his assumption of office in 2017, and obviously the many um, events which ha happened over the next years culminating in the January 6th, I don't know what we're calling it, insurrection, massacre, um, pick your term. Um, these observations really come to a great extent from the experience of teaching a course on fascism, a new general education course that I developed not that long ago and taught for the first time last spring semester, just as the, the that semester that got truncated so by the pandemic. And um, that as well as a um, sort of modest involvement in what has come to be called the fascism debate, um, which has been raging on social media for the last months and uh, well, most intensely for the last months anyway. Uh, the historian Gavriel Rosenfeld, among others, has noted that comparisons between Trump and Hitler um, or between the American 2016, 2017 and the German 1933 became increasingly frequent as Trump's popularity and his share of the Republican electoral vote um, began to rise, um, plunging historians, political scientists, and other observers into heady debates about several features, which I'm going to now talk about in just a little bit of detail. First of all, on a, on a more philosophical level or epistemologically, what is, what is the utility of historical analogy? In other words, if, if we wanna say Trump is like Hitler, or the United States at this moment is like Germany on the verge of the Nazi seizure of power. What does that tell us? What explanatory value does that have? Does that historians are really not in the business of predicting the future, but if we, what does, what purpose does it serve? If we decide that Trump and parts of today's Republican party are indeed fascist, which is a question I'll leave open. Um, again, what, what is the significance of that label? Right. What what does is that a um, does that make them any worse than if they're just white supremacist anti democratic activists? So, in other words, what what work do these labels and these historical signifiers do? Secondly, if we're going to be in the business of making historical comparisons, then which historical precedents are most useful for illuminating today's situation? So, of course, uh, there are the fascist examples, um, whether we want to compare the United States in these years to Nazi Germany, to fascist Italy, um, or are other kind of autocratic semi-fascist regimes in history more useful objects of comparison as, for example, Franco's Spain or Horty's Hungary, which are indeed anti-democratic, reactionary, militarily supported regimes uh, that at least bear some more than superficial resemblance to fascism, but aren't completely fascistic according to most historical consensus. Or is the best way to look at it, and here I think I'm connecting most to um, what we just heard from Ariella, um, is really the story that this is the latest, the framing, the, the most appropriate framing, that this is just the latest in a long series of the history of American, or a long historical antecedents uh, of racism, xenophobia, and white supremacy, right? So there's been a great deal of debate about whether, A, this is fascism, B, this is an American thing, C, whether this is a global thing, whether we best understand Trump in the context of 
other so-called strongmen in the, in the world today, um, Erdogan in Turkey, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Modi in India, and there are, of course, other examples one could cite as well. Um, now, my contribution to this debate is to really question why we have to choose, right? That in, in some ways, I mean, all of the, I don't understand why Trump and the forces around Trump can't be seen both as an expression of a long American history of white, racism and white supremacy, and as bearing certain key resemblances to what has happened in various historical examples of fascism and having a lot in common with what's going on in other parts of the world where similarly other countries are responding to the movement of populations to kind of globalization of industry and all the other forces which are besetting them. Um, just to, I, I won't speak long, but just to kind of drill down a little bit deeper into the, the fascism question. When I uh, began, when I conceptualized the class, the fascism general education class, I was a skeptic. I was very conservative in my use of the fascism concept. And I thought that it was best not to, I, I was of the school that fascism has to be restricted to the interwar European context. And so here I'm following the teachings of people like Robert Paxton, who was one of my own professors and leading authority on fascism, um, Victoria de Grazia, more recently Richard Evans, who say that the, the, there's a unique context to interwar European politics and that fascism is an expression of the anti-communism, anti-Semitism, misogyny, and I mean, the list could go on and on um, with a kind of cult of violence and death and a cult of the youth and a kind of right-wing revolutionary character. And that that's unique to that context and that things which have happened since the end of World War II might bear certain resemblance to fascism, but that they're, they're not fascism. And as I taught the class and as I got deeper into some of the other contexts, I began to think that that actually was not a sufficient way or not a satisfying way to understand fascism anymore. And here I became more influenced by people like Federico Finkelstein, who's um, written about Argentine-Italian connections and uh, about populism in Latin America and Europe, especially Jason Stanley, who's written recently about fascism and propaganda. To some extent, Ruth Ben Giat, who's written about um, dictators, dictators from Mussolini through Trump. And here, what I found especially influential was Finkelstein's idea or his assertion that a key to fascism is not necessarily in the historical conditions of this interwar European period at all. It's rather the idea that a, a particular leader, that what that leader utters is the truth. Right. And this kind of anti-enlightenment notion that the, um, that the truth isn't, can't be verified scientifically. It's not necessarily what you think it is that you can ignore and deny the evidence right in front of your face if the, the strong leader is telling you otherwise, right? So that idea, um, which I think we have seen exhibited very dramatically and st we're still seeing in our own political culture, right? To me, that, that is an essence of fascism and that is a real danger. And that is something that we're not, um, we're obviously not done with in, in our own moment. So um, I asking what, what it matters, what explanatory or predictive work um, these concepts do for us. Uh, I think we have to, think in terms of how they help us imagine resistance. If it's fascism, do we then resist it? We have to use different methods to oppose it than if it's not fascism. Um, how we imagine the daunting task of undoing the damage that this period has um, done to our institutions and to the practice of American democracy. Germany, of course, plays an outsized, outsized role in these, dis in, in these discussions, and I think maybe that's why I was invited to be on this panel. Um, Germany has obviously done, and, and um, this has been documented in some recent work, um, which compares the reckoning with the past that happened in Germany after, in the decades after World War II with the very kind of um, beginning stages of a reckoning with the past in the American South, right? And calls for um, the United States to deal frankly with its racist past to deal frankly with slavery in a way that's still hasn't happened or in some ways is only now just beginning all these 
century, decades and decades later. Um, the, event of, the events of recent weeks have revived and intensified the fascism debate since the election and above all since January 6th. Observers have been split between those who celebrate the resilience and solidity of our democratic institutions and those who warn that these events demonstrate their very fragility, right, and the contingency, the luck, if a few more key Republican leaders had chosen to go in a different direction, we would be in a very different place today, right? So I think I come down in that camp because I, it seems to be not at all a foregone conclusion that the sixth was the failure that it, it turned out to be. I fear that a country in which a significant percentage of the population is willing to reject democracy to keep their own leader in power, um, again, to link to what I said before, where a significant percentage of the population is willing to, or, or has, lives in a different truth world or a different truth universe than, another, than, than the rest of us, um, where we have such radically different notions of what is true, what is real, what is good, who this country is for, where incitement and vile hate speech have been given so much airing. Um, I feel, fear that um, this is a, a country which will remain beset by the dire threat uh, for some time to come. So finally, I just wanna add that just as, well, I guess what I wanna say is that the past is always changing just as the present is always changing, right? And a past that I thought I understood where the United States offered models for what Germany maybe which should strive to become has now shifted entirely where Germany offers models for what the United States should strive to become. In part, this builds on recent scholarship which has turned the tables by emphasizing the extent to which Nazi Germany was influenced by American ideas of race, by American treatment of native, of the native population, by American anti-Semitism, American racism and white supremacy and American eugenics. Um, and so parallel to that historiographic turn, the events of recent months and years really challenge solid conceptions or once solid conceptions about which countries must bear the burden of historical guilt and who offers sustainable models of democracy and tolerance. It's challenging, thrilling, but also terrifying to observe that we do not know the future of the past. Thanks. Thank you so much, Paul. I'm mean, hoping in Q&A and in conversation after, um, we might tease out some threads between you and Ariella, but also talk about, um, you know, the ways in which legislations around hate speech and the circulation of certain kinds of ideas in Germany may have created a different context there than um, what we experience in, in the US. You know, so I, you know, um, um, maybe we could open up to that afterward. But now we'll um, move on to Professor Sider. Hi, uh, <clears throat> thanks for inviting me, Tara. Um, you know, when I was in film school and for most of my career going to conferences, anytime somebody started mentioning the FCC, I would glaze over, you know. Uh, I could never retain any of the information and uh, that was something that other people did. I wanted to make documentaries or, you know, write books or, you know, do something. And, uh, and also that was the rise of cultural studies. And I think then we turned around one day after talking about active audiences and all that and realized like, oh, we gave away the store. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the media had been deregulated. The corporations had all, you know, um, uh, formed these massive units. And um, we weren't paying attention to the boring stuff uh, that turned out to be important. Can I have the PowerPoint? So this is just a very quick run through of some of the issues we're facing now after um, after we've got uh, uh, Trump banned from Twitter and Parler, not just taken off app stores, but the Amazon cloud server uh, isn't storing for it anymore. And of course, Amazon's cloud capacity is uh, one of the kind of hidden, uh, very important uh, principles here. Okay, anyway, so one thing we have to realize about the situation we're in today is that it, it started um, decades ago, and really Ronald Reagan is uh, responsible for uh, starting most of the damage. Next slide. 
so uh oh sorry let's go ahead here um i think i might have sent you the wrong i hope i didn't send you the wrong version of the thing anyway this is a uh, i was going to end with this but it's a quote from hannah rent about the subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced nazi or communist but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction and true and false no longer exists next slide Okay, you know what? I sent you the wrong one, so I'm going to do a. Uh, can I do? A, can I still do a, a screen share? Um, yeah. I, 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 okay. Sorry about that. I had. Um, I kept working away at this thing. Okay, so I'm, I, and I'll start talking about. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, there we go. Um, uh, let's see, I need some kind of access here. Sorry about that. Um, oh, and I'm going to make you Co-host. Co-host. Okay. Yeah, yeah cuz it doesn't quite want to let me get this up here. Do you have the, um, the button at the bottom at the bottom? Yeah, it's just um the problem there we go. Okay. I'm still getting this please grant access to screen sharing. Um uh you want to try want to try a new one to new one to edit? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so let me uh, just uh, talk a little bit about, um, um, uh, first of all, where the idea of regulating uh, media comes from. Um, uh, there is a principle called the public interest, and that was based on the idea that uh, in the beginning for radio and for um, broadcast, that if we're going to give people um the uh, um, if we're going to give uh, broadcasters licenses, uh, they are using a public resource like water and air and you know mining rights and that sort of thing. So they um, they uh, deserve to uh, give us something back for that. They can't just you know, be broadcasting and not do you know anything at all. So, um, so there was the idea of the public interest that they have to operate in the public interest. So they made them do some things like have children's programming and public affairs programming. And you'll notice that um, uh, they pushed those things into Saturday morning and Sunday morning, the dead times. Um, and at various times, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, would lean on them to do, do a better job of it. Um, uh, hang on one second here. Ellen, I, Ellen, I, I, I some of the, uh, 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 the, the price sharing. Pardon? Try sharing your sharing your screen again yeah you're you're i just sent it to you again i'm really sorry about this um let's see if we can anyway um so licensees had this obligation to offer non-commercial programs and then in 46 they came up with the fairness doctrine which said that you have to have honest equitable and balanced coverage of controversial issues of public importance um, that withstood a lot of First Amendment challenges from the Supreme Court, uh, but nevertheless, the FCC abolished it in 87. Congress voted to reinstate it, and Reagan uh, vetoed that. So that has a lot to do with where we are today um, because, um, oh, there we go. Have we got the right one now? Um, no, it's still not right. Sorry. Is that the second one I sent? Okay, I'll just I'll just talk through this. Um, uh, so, uh, what was the result of that? Well, the result of that was the 
you know, immediate rise of Fox News, um, uh, the um, uh, rise of right-wing talk radio, a sharp increase in political polarization, um, the mobilization of the Christian right, uh, this idea that we're in a an echo chamber in terms of political viewpoints. You can just go to one narrow casting thing and listen to that. And, um, and all of these things were pushed further by social media. And they were pushed further by social media because social media exists for, you know, two things to sell, um, to do data mining about their users. So they were able to locate and suggest and push stuff out to those most vulnerable to this. Um, and they're selling advertising. So their goal is just to get as many people as possible, you know, no matter what. Um, so we have things even just this week, like um, the, uh, the um, CEO of... Um, of uh, Facebook saying, "Oh, we didn't do it. We none of none of that was us. Um, we it was the other platforms that were doing it." And almost immediately, it it was true that um, you know journalists went and you know did some fact checking and uh, found out that um, um, you. Uh, actually, let's see, maybe this is going to work finally. Did that, I just tried to share it again. No, sorry. Um, and immediately, you know, they produced all these posters of, of, uh, how they had, you know, the great betrayal is over, see you January 6th, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what is the problem that we're going to have with regulating social media platforms? A lot of people believe the uh, horses out of the barn already um, should have happened a long time ago. Uh, it's going to be very difficult now. What are the reasons for that? Well, the most common form of news right now is ads disguised as news stories. All right. So since advertising is the business, there's going to be a real disincentive to do that. Secondly, a lot of the time, platforms generally don't know the origins of posts compared to what broadcasters and publishers did. They had institutional practices and a desire to evaluate the accuracy of posts, which social media doesn't have. And they had a goal to, um, and, the, and the key thing is that the acceleration of the speed of news is staggering. So it isn't once a day, tune in at 6 p.m. It's bad, fake news is out there really fast, and uh, retractions of that are relatively slow by comparison. The other issues for social media regulation are that it's very hard to define or enforce the jurisdiction. Of course, these are entities that are all operating across national boundaries. Technology is interconnected and decentralized, and all of these companies have a deep commitment to a libertarian political stance to the free market and are very invested against regulation. They also are big contributors to all the politicians. Um, they have vast wealth like we've never seen on any scale before. And they're in the habit of just lying for PR purposes all the time. In fact, you know, some of the most uh, extreme bald-faced, you know, lies come out. And it, and actually right now where Facebook is thinking like, oh, should we really ban Trump forever? It's going to this oversight committee, but the oversight committee was, of course, created itself by the social media companies. Um, and in every case, with regulation, we're going to wind up with uh, very, very complex issues around, um, um, uh, let's see, around First Amendment rights. Um, you have to remember that the Supreme Court has time and time again upheld free speech rights, including uh, hate speech, uh, um, lies, uh, 
you know, um, harassing, you know, mourners of, you know, gay relatives, all kinds of like unspeakable things. It is part of the First Amendment. And this attempt to start to regulate is going to bump up against that in all kinds of ways, whether it's about disseminating, disseminating posts or, um, uh, or challenging the accuracy of them. Um, so it's a big job, you know, ahead of us. We've all had this nice sort of respite with uh, Trump off Twitter, but, um, uh, you know, that was a lot of business for Twitter. And uh, and uh, they're all going to try to, you know, get these voices uh, back on there. And in fact, they, you know, they said, like Facebook said, they weren't still um, trying to get people into political groups. They're still doing it, you know, uh, all the time. So um, it's something we're going to all have to uh, keep learning about as boring as it might be to those of you who'd rather have a camera in your hands and, you know, be out there uh, doing something fun about it. Thanks. Um, there's definitely, I think, threads across the kind of three presentations, although they come from different historic moments and different geographies and different disciplines to think about um, how we arrived at the space we're in, but also what possible paths forward might be. So I wonder if I could ask, you know, each of the panelists just to speak a little bit about one, I, I mean, I know, Paul, that you said historians don't speak to the future, right? But I'm going to ask you to do that anyway, and Ariella as well, and Ellen, to think about what you think a possible um, way forward is in the scenario that we're in. I think each of you hinted to things about around historical memory, around regulation, but is there um, a conceptual or concrete thing that you could identify that points us toward how we might understand this moment and secure democracy in ways that feel fragile now? Um, well, since I'm in a law school, I can, <laughs> even though I'm a historian, I can, uh, <laughs> I'll jump in there. Um, I first just wanted to, to thank, say thank the, to my fellow panelists, very interesting, and, and to wholeheartedly agree with Paul that we don't need to choose between, uh, you know, uh, the kind of homegrown history of these um, you know, movements and a global perspective. And I think, um, you know, one thing that uh, U.S. historians have become very cognizant of is how parochial our lens has been traditionally. Um, and, and lately we've been seeing really the dangers of American exceptionalism in a number of spheres. And so, um, I completely agree that, um, you know, we're seeing a, uh, a rise of these right wing nationalist um, so called populist movements um, around the world and, uh, and they, there are a lot of common strands it's worth pulling out, um, you know, in terms of uh, what might happen or could happen here. Uh, it, you know, I take a lot of um, hope and also um, inspiration from the fact that this summer's, you know, protests and uprisings are really translated into political organizing and important political victories this fall. Um, it seems to me that, you know, again, if you if you're drawing parallels between first reconstruction and backlash, um, you know, we are now in the midst of the backlash to the second reconstruction, right? <laughs> um, that that's uh, and and so what's needed is a third reconstruction. And if if this summer could be could have 
you know, it's too soon to tell whether we're now in the beginning of a third reconstruction. I think that will take place both with some really important legal and constitutional reforms that are, um, whether it's the new, you know, Voting Rights Act, um, statehood for D.C. and Puerto Rico, all of the things that are needed to shift, to expand democracy by um, shifting our current constitutional order that was that's still based in these structures that supported slavery. Um, so all of these moves that require political organizing to back them up, like none of those things are going to happen without just continued massive pressure. Um, but, but, you know, that seems to be starting to happen. So I'm like cautiously hopeful. So if you're going to force me to predict <laughs> the future or at least speculate, um, I'm, I mean, I, I guess we're, we're all capable of embracing contradictory feelings at the same time, right? Because I share Ariella's cautious optimism. It seems to me that cert what happened over the summer was, I don't, I don't know if I can say unprecedented, but at least in my lifetime, it seems like it was kind of, an, for part of the population, it was an unprecedented kind of soul searching and reckoning with, with not only the racist past, but, but the racist present. Um, and just really um, something, I mean, all of, all of my predictions about the future are wrong. So I don't wanna, but cause I'm just thinking about things that, I, things that don't seem possible, right? And I mean, I'm, I, 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 the example that always comes to my mind is some years ago, I mean, it must've been more than 10, I was talking to some friends ab about same-sex marriage and um, how it's, I, I, I just thought that there's no way this can happen in my, in my lifetime. And I remember, you know, learning about those who, my one particular friend who thought, let's not even try now let's just hope that the next generation in 20 years will be open and you know whereas some people pushing again again pushing the issue forcing it to get out into the open as something to be discussed so what i'm trying to say is it's things that don't seem possible can then very suddenly shift and i i, I think that's why i'm especially reluctant to predict so back to where i was i share that optimism that we're having discussions. We had discussions over the summer as a country that we really need to be having, and and they're really profound and difficult topics, and important ones. At the same time, um, as Ellen says, there's a lot of money to be made in this kind of online media environment. Um, that that uh, extremism is uh, it has a pull over people. And it's, I, I don't think we're out of the woods yet. And I think it, it will be a long time until we're out of the woods, if we get out of those woods. And, and I think um, what would be needed would be um, a continuation of the work that began this summer, along with some kind of rebuilding of that media landscape that Ellen hinted at, this sort of res restoring local media markets and some kind of accountability in journalism. Uh, because I, I, I don't think I mean, I feel myself falling back into these kind of Habermasian notions of the public sphere, which I always, I never took that seriously in the past, but now that we really don't have a public sphere anymore, we don't really have two sides which respect each other's opinions. And, you know, I do think some work needs to be done to restore that. But, um, you know, maybe someday we'll look back and say January 6th was a, was a kind of turning point, a reality check where we, as a country, realized just how serious these threats were. Or we will look back and say, too bad we didn't really deal with that then because it turned out to come back to haunt us in an even more destructive way. Or in Ariella's terms, we'll have a really poor tourist marker that you know um, doesn't narrate history very well. Um, Ellen? Hi, yeah, when, um, you know, this month I was thinking, uh, you know, what I think that this is basically, we're facing a problem that stems from all of the work of neoliberal economics. So we're facing 
a large white unemployed sector um, that has had increasingly diminished wages and uh, job prospects, uh, et cetera. So one thing is to start looking at labor and, uh, you know, one, one way to pull people back from the right, that is, you know, the right took, cherry picked a few ideas from the left and mobilized people in a way that the left has not been to in a really long time um, and still, you know, kind of falters. There was, you know, hope this summer. But, you know, um, the Nazis had this idea, Gleichschaltung, which was the coordination and organization of politics, social institutions, legal institutions. And so I think about what's happened with employment and I think about what's happened with education, that basically part of this problem is the, you know, goes back again to Reagan in terms of deregulation of schools, rise of charter schools, religious schools, uh, taking away the power of teachers to make their own curriculum by teaching to the test, therefore also making a lot of people drop out of school, out of boredom and, you know, lack of interest. A lot of teachers have left the profession. So I, I would, I think that places like labor struggles, um, education reform, um, are really important. I don't think we can leave religion to just the, you know, Christian fundamentalists, uh, because it's, you know, a big part of a lot of people's lives in um, a lot of areas of the country and, and can, and has historically been such a force uh, for good. Um, so, you know, I think of this in terms of like, yeah, there's got to be more regulation. There has to be more of a cap on these vast, uh, uh, differences in wealth and, you know, the concentration, you know, so many people slipping into poverty and such vast concentrations of wealth and, and kind of taking back the schools so that we can start to educate people so that they would be able to see through, you know, some of what they're finding um, on the new internet and, you know, social media and, and that sort of thing. So very small things, right? You know, um, labor, um, employment, education, right? But also things that historically we have located as bedrocks for um, how the U.S. has imagined democracy, right? I think, you know, as well, Ellen, you mentioned struggles around um, freedom of speech versus the limiting of speech. And I see that as a, a kind of crucial point at which pressure might be applied, you know, maybe not with the immediate Supreme Court we have in this moment, but, you know, over a medium hall. Other nations regulate hate speech much more um, rigorously than the United States. So when a platform like um, Twitter or YouTube tells you they can't you know, be responsible for everything that's on the platform. When those multinational corporations operate in Germany or in Canada, they don't have a problem removing the things that would get them into legal trouble within those countries' context where speech is more regulated. So there is actually a way to um, know what's happening on your platform and to regulate toward it, although we don't, we don't see that um, very often. Um, Evan, did you have a question you want to um, speak? I'm, not, I'm in a loud household with okay. dog snoring, so that's why I posted it in the, the chat. But I, I participate on a lot of, um, of uh, USC-wide um, uh, diversity meetings with different diversity officers from the various schools. And, and a lot of what we talk about is, is how to figure out uh, the relationship in the classroom that we have with our students who might um, sympathize with, with uh, the so-called alt-right or white supremacist sort of ideology. And there's a lot of discussion about rejecting them as 
um, really pushing them into radicalization versus trying to embrace them in the classroom, knowing what that might mean for the classroom and the trauma that could inflict on many of the other students. And I've been reading um, recently um, about similar types of things happening with the shutdown of Parler and how white nationalist groups are looking at this uh, through a positive lens of recruitment and thinking about, you know, how to bring people who are, are probably a little bit sympathetic to authoritarianism, uh, white supremacy, more into the fold, further radicalize. And, um, you know, I know that among the, the diversity liaisons, you know, we haven't really been able to figure that out, but I'm interested to know thoughts of, on panelists about, you know, um, how to deal with um, specifically network technologies that, you know, that, uh, these types of ideologies coalesce around and then, um, you know, removing them and then what happens in, in kind of that after, aftermath. Yeah, and I think those are really crucial questions to grapple with in terms of how the ecology of platforms unfold. And they're not new in relation to parlor, right? So we know that after Gamergate, the kind of, um, um, unease produced by, um, women in relation to video games opened up a huge space for the far right to step into and recruit and um, bring into their fold um, teenage white men, right? And that's very well documented. There are a couple of different books on that process now. And similar strategies are unfolding in the wake of um, the QAnon kind of disappointment that, you know, the things that were predicted to happen um, before the inauguration did not. So there's, um, you know, kind of patterns I think we could understand. I mean, one of the things I am interested in in the context of a cinema school that many of us sit in, right, is what might powerful counter media look like that could circulate through these same platforms and address particularly young people with narratives that are different than the narratives from the far right that are available um, without looking very hard all over YouTube and, and other kinds of platforms. So I think as media makers, there's a possibility to offer um, other stories in ways that circulate in the forms of contemporary media as well. So I, you know, I track a set of um, YouTube influencers who are anti far right and who produce media that's meant to open up the possibility to think differently. But I think there's a space for the cinema school to participate with our, you know, very rich traditions of documentary production um, in helping to produce um, counter media. But I wonder what the other panelists think. Or maybe we should open up to, you know, the kind of field at large. I mean, feel free to unmute yourself to ask a question or you can raise your hand. Um, we could also try to manage the chat if people want to um, type things in. Although I'll warn you, I have um, some vision difficulty and reading the chat is not my strong suit. So. Um, Alan? Yes, hello. Uh, thank you so much for taking this time today. It has been fascinating and really informing to hear you all speak. Um, I had a question quickly about um, the Electoral College and what role you believe that plays in terms of the fight for democracy, um, and however you want to respond to that. Ariella, do you want to start on that one? Sorry, can you repeat that, Mike? daughter was bombarding me at the exact same moment. <laughs> yes, no problem. I was just uh, wondering um, what role you believe, uh, if any, um, the Electoral College uh, plays in the fight for democracy. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm glad you asked that. I was just, uh, you know, um, kind of alluding at the end to the, you know, we, we now have a variety of, of constitutional structures that um, were not particularly, you know, they were anti-democratic to start with, 
and, um, and they've become in some ways even more so as our population has grown even more skewed. Um, you know, the Electoral College ironically originally supported slavery not because of the Senate, but really because of the House of Representatives, the, the interaction between the Electoral College, which is based on both the number of senators and the number of representatives the state has, when you combine that with the three-fifths clause, which gave this added to Southern representation through non-voting enslaved people being counted, um, gave the South disproportionate political power. Now um, it's the uh, it's the fact that the Senate is so un anti democratic, right? The fact that Wyoming gets, you know, two senators at the, just like California, and then the Electoral College, you know, in, enormously imbalances um, presidential elections then towards those same um, sparsely populated areas. Um, and, and so many of these mechanisms, I mean, we're now talking about the filibuster, right? So already in the Senate, which is 50-50 right now, Democrats represent 41 million more Americans than Republicans because the senators from, the Republican senators are representing these empty states. Now, if you add the filibuster in, then you're really taught, and you have to get 60 votes for everything, then you're really talking about a tiny minority holding hostage the rest of us. And, um, and so we, we are, when we think about what, you know, if there, a new constitution, constitutional transformation would look like or a third reconstruction, we really have to imagine things like getting rid of, rid of, the, rid of the electoral college reforming or at the very least adding to the Senate to, to shift that balance because um, we are now being represented by, uh, you know, those of us who live in a place like Los Angeles really have our votes count for much less. The last thing I'll say is that the 15th Amendment, which um, people talk about as having guaranteed the right to vote, did not guarantee the right to vote. We do not have an affirmative right to vote in the U.S. Constitution. We have a negative right not to have your vote denied on the basis of race or color or previous condition of servitude. And then we added sex and, and you know, re lowered the age. But we need a constitutional amendment giving an affirmative right to vote so that everyone's vote counts, including people who live in Los Angeles. There's my rant. Afternoon. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Thank you so much. Other questions? I, I had a question. Uh, yeah. At the insurrection the other week, there seems to be this distinction between those that went into the Capitol building and those who marched there but didn't quite enter the premises. What do you feel is the relevancy of that distinction and how might it relate to some of the past events that were mentioned? Well, I think one of the purposes for legal issues of that distinction is whether or not um, the government can pursue to arrest someone based on unlawful entry, right? Because um, not having legal restrictions around hate speech or, you know, some other kinds of um, violent um, action, the ability to arrest somebody rested on whether or not, you know, they were unlawful in some way. So there's a, a real tension there between the right to assembly and um, the right to not have the government suppress your speech, and then um, what it means to incite violence, right? And, and um, often, as Ellen suggested, the court leans 
toward free speech at the Supreme Court level rather than toward um, harm you may be causing others by, you know, inciting violence or other actions, right? So um, I suspect, you know, I, I don't see a firm distinction, you know, but I think the distinction operates legally in how they'll go after charging particular people for trespass or, um, you know, violent behavior. I, I did want to mention just one, you know, um, since as I mentioned, I'm teaching the 14th Amendment and, and most 14th Amendment jurisprudence focuses on just two clauses in uh, the first section of the 14th Amendment, the uh, guarantee of equal protection of the laws to all persons within the jurisdiction of the United States and of due process of the law um, to all persons. but. Uh, 14th Amendment Section 3 has been getting a little bit of play this past week for the first time again in 150 years since the first Reconstruction. Section 3 is the one that says it was really aimed at keeping Confederates out of public office. It says that if you've been involved in insurrection or treason against the United States, that you cannot hold public office. And a lot of people have been urging, including um, you know, some, some pretty uh, distinguished uh, historians of US Reconstruction have been urging Congress to um, go after not only President Trump, uh, but also Josh Hawley, Ted Cruz, and others who um, incited insurrection um, under 14th Amendment Section 3, which unlike impeachment doesn't require two thirds of Congress, but only a simple majority vote. It does require legislation, but if they passed a resolution censuring those members of Congress or the president, they could then have them um, either removed from office or never be able to hold office again um, with just a majority vote. Now, would this Supreme Court uphold that, you know, <laughs> um, I'll, it, who knows, but um, it certainly happened in the 18, early 1870s. Some um, office holders were removed from office based on Section 3. Then an amnesty was passed, a broad amnesty of Confederates was passed in 1873, and so they were able to, to run again. And then even more ignominiously in the 1970s, Jefferson date Congress extended the amnesty to Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee. Um, but uh, there's no reason why they couldn't do it. It certainly wouldn't hurt. Um, Paul, I was wondering if you could um, unpack for folks who may not be familiar um, the kind of nod you gave to recent scholarship that looks at how Germany's policies in the 30s and 40s were actually very influenced by um, things the U.S. was already undertaking in relation to race and ethnicity. I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure how familiar people are with that sort of um, new historical work, and it might be useful to, to kind of tell people. I mean, sure, I can talk about that. I think Ariella can also talk about that. Um, because I think she has um, been, she's done some work in, in, in that area as well. But um, I mean, in a, it, 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 the, the, the key, um, now I'm, you're gonna have to help me with the title of his book um, because I can't come up with it on- It's Hitler's American Model. Thank you, Hitler's American Model, which must be about five years old now. Something like that. Uh, something like that by um, James Whitfield, which um, I mean, I think the central, observation there was was always known and I, I know you know in my lectures about eugenics I always kind of tacked it on at the end that you know to kind of after people I'm after my audience has you know been exposed to the horrors committed um, um, in the name of eugenics uh, in Nazi Germany to then kind of do this surprise ending by noting that in some ways the United States was the forerunner I mean of course 
in the U.S., um, steril involuntary sterilization long preceded anything that happened in Germany. Um, already, I think it was 1903, 1904, the state of Indiana started, and then uh, more than a dozen other states were involved in eugenic sterilization. Um, but I think what I think the extent to which the Nazis looked to the United States as a model is something that had not been appreciated up until that book and the debates and controversies that it that it spawned and the, um, you know, which really, in many ways, it's a coincidence that book could have come out earlier, could come out, it, it, it's not connected at all to Trump and to recent political events in the United States. But I think taken together, they, the, that research and our kind of move closer to fascism in our own political culture really upend um, simple kinds of historical comparisons or um, challenge those dichotomies about, I mean, I, I think how you didn't really ask me to go in this direction, but I, I, I for one feel really naive and, and pretty apologetic to past students who had to listen to me draw contrasts between notions of Germanness and Americanness when I would say, you know, despite the persistence of racism in the United States, nevertheless, no one would challenge the Americanness of an African American. And I'm like, what was I thinking? How naive and blind could I have been? Because that's exactly what's happened, right? And and that Americanness and whiteness that, you know, of course our notions of citizenship are racial too. And so I mean I think that's kind of a scattershot answer, but in in so many ways, um, you know. And then and then the book I mentioned or I alluded to toward the end of my comments was Susan Neiman, um, who's an American who's based in Potsdam at the Einstein Forum in Germany, who wrote this book called Learning from the Germans. Uh, she spent a fellowship year in Mississippi. Uh, Ariella, you'll probably know the name of the institute. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but um, an institute that deals with American kind of truth and reconciliation and getting uh, Americans to getting Southerners to deal with the, the um, legacy of racism um, and use that as a kind of way of launching into this longer, larger comparison of the debates about dealing with the past in Germany versus the US and there, you know, really reverses the polarities again to say that actually after a very slow start when Germans tended to not want to talk about fascism or accept really any historical guilt. But after a couple of decades, starting, you know, they, they paid reparations, they, you know, maybe we should think about paying reparations. They, um, <laughs> they took down monuments, they purged some, not nearly enough, but some people out of key academic and civil service positions and embarked on a process of trying to work through their own fascist past. Now an imperfect and complete process, but nevertheless more of a process than I think any other culture country has, has gone through. I find also the, um, the way in which in Germany certain symbols have been forbidden from kind of public use and recognized as violent in their echoes, right, is also, you know, instructive for the United States as we watch the types of flags being, you know, carried into the capital by, um, you know, during the um, coup or insurrection, right, that, that those symbols in the U.S. flow quite freely and, you know, they're decontextualized, but they're still very harmful, right, and, and the U.S. has not um, taken um, a kind of stance to recognize those legacies and to, to regulate them. Absolutely, and it's, Absolutely. And it's I mean, sorry, I'm getting sorry, that. I'm getting Delay, which is making it harder for me to talk. Um, um, uh, I think for a German historian, it's really jarring. Sorry, it's really jarring. I just muted everybody to make the echo stop, so now you'll have to unmute yourself again. Thank you. Sorry. I'm, that that helped a lot. I don't know what what I said, but just for a European historian to see confederate flags and swastikas together is very jarring and confusing. But I, you know, I understand that there are there are places, it, there's, a, there's a history there that's been written about and studied um, to some extent that makes it a little bit clearer. But I mean, Tara, yeah, that, that's a really important point. I, um, I, 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 again, I think in this area, I've kind of changed my position because originally as a, you know, an American born free speech person, I was always a bit 
confused about German laws that prohibit the display of Nazi uh, Nazi symbols or pr prohibit certain speech acts, um, which were not, you know, like Heil Hitler and so forth, um, which are legal, you know, which are punishable. You can be fined, there's even prison time, depending on the severity of it. And again, that really offended my kind of American sensibility. And my, I think now I recognize as a kind of naive way of thinking that the best way to deal with this stuff is to get it out in the open and talk about it and educate. But now I see that there's actually, it's actually quite useful to not allow things out in the open. So I'm no longer sure how I feel about that. Um, I don't think that for the prohibition of certain symbols and utterances and texts, I don't think that Germans are less educated about the dangers of fascism than Americans. Now, on the other hand, I don't want to sound like I'm presenting Germany as a perfect, you know, they certainly haven't done everything right either. And there is a radical neo-Nazi movement and the, they have all of the same problems we have today too. They're just not quite not as, quite as uh, uh, influential as they are in the United States at the moment. Um, unless anyone has a final question or comment, Ellen, is that a hand? Is it? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say, you know, I was in sabbatical in Berlin, um, and, you know, the thing is, there's memorials everywhere, and people are just, like, taking, you know, beauty shots and drinking, and, you know, I mean, the, the, the people's behavior at, you know, concentration camp sites and memorials is really scary and you know they you, you can use the symbols but thus folk as a term has come back really big um you can hear it on tv every night and uh yeah so it's it's you know like every place it's something that requires vigilance constant you know monitoring and constant efforts to, you know, kind of reach out, I, I, you know, I think, um, and, um, and be willing to take on, you know, the people who, whose ideas might repel you. Um, Laura, Laura, has mute everybody again. Laura has asked in the in the chat about um, you know how heavily we may be leaning on the South as the repository of all things evil in America. Um, I wrote a book about that. Ariella has written a little bit about it, right? Um, the South definitely becomes a convenient way for the U.S. to disavow all of its other racist histories, right? Because we could pretend it only happened down there, right? And and certainly while a lot of it did happen down there, and that's historically the site of um, the most kind of intense repercussions of slavery, you know, American racism is widespread. It's, it's not only located in the region of the South. So I think it is important to, to recognize the ways in which the South is a problem in America and the ways in which um, Amer the South is throughout America, right? In, in very real ways through patterns of migration, but also symbolically in the way the South gets called upon to function in, in certain registers. Maybe we could have one last question from Ronald. I promised Paul we would be done by four. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys for doing this. It's really been uh, very uh, stimulating. Uh, picking up on Professor Lerner's last comments, can you guys elaborate a bit on our own First Amendment uh, controversy? Um, I think that there's rare uh, consensus along political lines, but everyone seems to agree that the First Amendment protection on speech is not absolute. Everyone seems to accept, I guess, um, the, the law school example of you can't yell fire in a crowded theater when there's no fire because that may impel uh, uh, intense physical um, action that can result in um, great harm. It's like people getting crushed at the exit. One can certainly compare that with what Trump has been saying for months, calling a, a, a legitimate election um, stolen and a fraud is at least to many of us, yelling fire in a crowded theater. Um, and so why is it controversial? I can see why people on the right 
uh, object because they want to you know have more Trump. But I hear from the ACLU and I hear reservations from people on the more progressive side. Um, is that just a knee-jerk reaction to the fact that none of us like big tech or gigantic tech? Um, or is there any legitimate reason to doubt that Trump has really violated the reasonable um, limits on our First Amendment uh, rights? We might need a whole nother teaching to get okay. in, to the depths of, you know, um, First Amendment issues. Sorry. <laughs> but I mean, also the peculiar Americanism of certain understandings of free speech, right? So, you know, the, the First Amendment is about the government regulation of speech. So it, it doesn't apply to a lot of other contexts, but most Americans don't even have that kind of um, you know, constitutional literacy. Um, Ariella, I know you have thoughts on this. I just wanted to actually pick up on something Lisa put in the chat that I was also gonna, to, gonna say something about earlier when we were talking about, you know, European versus um, US models, um, which, it, you know, Lisa says, um, I think the caution is we need to make sure these regulations aren't turned around and used against progressives. And I know, you know, and I, I know the French context better than the German, but where there are, you know, more more limits on on speech, and in fact, you know, you can criminalize um, certain kinds of speech. Um, it, there was, uh, you know, there's been um, one prosecution for denial of slavery being a crime against humanity, but then, you know, right-wingers turned around and passed a law saying you have to teach that colonialism was a, colonization was a positive good in Africa, you know, yeah. and, um, and most of the time these prosecutions are not used against the Trumps, they're used against the um, you know, the marginalized people. Like, so, I, you know, I'm not a, a First Amendment absolutist, but I actually think there is far more that we could do in this country to fight, um, you know, ter domestic terrorist, white supremacist organizations without going after speech, which is really hard to do anyway. It's just hard to do effectively. And there are so many effective ways to go after these people that we didn't do. And, and so far from doing it, we had a, a, a you know, a, a um, police force that enabled it. I mean, we <laughs> we invited them in. It wouldn't have been hard to stop what happened on January 6th, it, but it, it was the other way around. So I guess I'm, I'm skeptical that we need to break down First Amendment doctrine in order to be effective politically. I think there is far more that, that we could be doing without touching speech. Um, I mean, I think it's also a question of what it means to touch speech. It's not, you know, a binary that you do or you don't, right? It's already regulated in all sorts of ways. The kind of media deregulation that Ellen spoke of allowed many different kinds of speech to happen in um, television and in platforms than could have happened prior to that wave of deregulation in the late 80s. So there are you know, many kind of different ways we might think about how speech functions. And, but I think the, the warning that to be careful about what you put into place is really relevant in terms of what we saw happen in, in January, right? Um, a lot of activists now who work with Muslim and other communities are worried about laws that might be passed in the name of domestic terrorism, right? Or even calling the white insurrectionist domestic terrorists, right? Because it opens up um, a sense that you could then police domestic terrorists with the same legislation who are not white, who may not in fact be terrorists, right? So the, the kind of language we know as, you know, scholars of the humanities and of culture and of history, language is hard, but it's also really important, right? And it's, it's a thing we'll continue to grapple with. 
Um, I want to thank those of you who joined us for giving up part of your Friday afternoon to, to participate in um, this kind of um, conversation in a community. It felt, I think, to many of us that faced with what we, what we saw on January 6th and what um, the four years leading up to it have um, revealed to us that an educational institution like USC, it's vitally important to understand how the moment we're in is connected to histories that, you know, predate all of us and to think collectively about what paths forward might be. And finally, if you could unmute yourself despite the echo and um, give a round of applause to Ellen and Ariella and Paul.